It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with financial advisors Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. I am your host. My name is Mike Bernard. Thanks for being with us. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the show. Across from me in the KFG studios, certified financial planner Kevin Corhorn. Between us, special guest Diane Bennett. Are you intrigued by the continued strength of the housing market? Is now the right time to buy or sell? We're glad to welcome back special friend and guest Diane Bennett, who's a realtor at Remax 100 Inspired Homes, to hear her update of the housing market and how that impacts you. I'm actually most excited. Kevin's finally getting over his cold, and he yeah. sounds more like a radio show star now. Well, so. yeah. I, Glad to have you, the my, real Kevin back. Yeah, my fans have been very, very concerned <laughs> about my condition, Mike, as it's gone. This um, typhoid diphtheria combination has uh, has uh, lingered uh, along with the yellow fever for about uh, three weeks now. So we're hopefully we'll... Uh, be back to skating at full strength soon. There you go. So we've got a couple of questions from fans of the show about, well, one about, hey, we just sold because the housing market's so high, and another person who's looking to buy, and we're hoping to get Diane's in, input on that. If you have questions, reach out to us. You can do so in a couple different ways. Call or text 574-222-2000. That's 574 574- Two 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 thousand. Find us online, wisemoneyradio.com. You can also find us all over social media. The YouTube channel's right there. Every episode's right there. You can catch up on it. Just search Wise Money Radio, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Well, the housing market continues to get a whole bunch of attention. You've all heard the stories of people with bidding wars and all that sort of stuff. But here's a question. So does that mean it's time to sell? Is it time to buy? What will interest rates do to all of this? And what about the new construction? I'm, I'm curious to ask Diane about that later in the program, all the new construction that we're seeing. So we're diving into all that with special guest Diane Bennett. She's a great friend of ours. And uh, before we dive in, even though she's sort of a regular on the Wise Money Show, why don't you introduce us yourself to us? Not a problem. Good morning, and thanks for having me. My name is Diane Bennett. I'm a realtor with REMAX 100 in Indiana and Inspired Homes in Michigan. Our team of 11 serves in both states, and we love to help people who have questions about buying, selling, and all, all that goes with residential real estate. 11 team members. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. That's something um, that is extremely important and very helpful about your team. So, all right, we're going to dive right in. Is now the time to sell your house? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I probably would say yes, that any time. Yeah. Um, absolutely. It is a great time to sell your home. Um, I can tell you that there are a lot of people that think, oh, because it's a great time to sell, I'm just going to go up on market. It's going to be easy. You still have to do all the right things. Ah, really? You still have to do all the right so things. So what are the right things? So I would, I would first recommend that you hire a experienced realtor who has, you know, n- the knowledge, the experience, mm-hmm. and the high integrity to advise you well. Mm-hmm. You There's certain price ranges that do still have more of a seller's market than other price ranges. So mm-hmm. your price range depends. If you overprice, you're going to sit even though... Really? Yes. If you're too high, the buyers go in and they question it and their agents question your price and they as, assume you're greedy. As an outsider here that, you know, just in hearing all of the stories and how quickly things are selling, it's sort of, I don't know, sort of refreshing to hear that that's still happening. You just, it just, I, I want to make sure, or I'm just cautious on the lookout for, is this another 06, 07 where people really don't care uh, about what the price is, so it's it's sort of it's refreshing to hear you say that there's still um, uh, some quality control, I guess, on the on the price. So we're also seeing a lot of um, appraisal issues if it is too high. Really? So even if it goes up over appraised price, mm-hmm. the appraisers have to back up the the price with the past sales. Yeah, right. So if someone can pay over appraised price. They're helping increase all the values around them, and some people can do that. In certain price ranges, that's a little bit harder. We actually had eight offers on one home, three of which were significantly over asking price. I asked the appraiser if we could present the spreadsheet of all eight to him, and 
Yeah, he's like, no, it doesn't really matter. I have to prove past sales. I have to share past sales. So it, it just at the risk of hopping on a little soapbox here, it, it does seem crazy to me that an appraiser is going that tells you what the value is. Yeah. When last time I checked, the value is what a willing buyer is willing to pay for something. <laughs> so isn't it funny if when you say it out loud, you think, is that really the way it works? But yeah, it really is the way it works, isn't it? I could be on a soapbox. I don't want to be on a yeah. soapbox, so, but I, I would love to see them be able to use things like our spreadsheets that clearly the market is is demanding that this house be more a higher price. So re- just a quick question then. So if, if I go to buy a house and it doesn't appraise and I'm doing a 20% down program, w- what is my option now? Who's Who's on the hook if I... If I put my earnest money down, I put in my offer, the offer has been accepted, but the appraisal doesn't support the numbers, what do we do? So it depends on how you wrote the offer. If you're in competition and your agent recommended that you write over appraised price so that you'd win it, then you're, you've are you already agreed to ahead of time. Okay. It's always negotiable. The contract, the state contract in Indiana, the Michigan contract doesn't talk about appraisal. The Indiana um, purchase agreement does talk about the appraised price, and it must appra- must appraise if an appraisal is done. We actually write that into our Michigan contracts. Not every agent does. Hmm. And so it has to appraise or the sale doesn't have to go through. So the parties can renegotiate. The parties can decide if they want to go through. You know, if it didn't appraise for you, it might not appraise for the next buyer. Is it possible that someone with just cash can come in and say, I don't care if it appraised? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. So the appraisal you see that. is important so that the buyer maybe, I don't know, can rethink their number. But at the same time, it's whatever they were they agreed upon with the seller, it's just the bank then. If they're going to the front the money. The appraisal is for the bank, right. If the they're going to front the money, bank. they want to make sure. But if that. I'm a seller and I have an offer that I've accepted, I, I probably shouldn't go out and spend that money yet because it, it, the – you're not closed until you're closed. Right. Correct. So the yeah. so cuz the appraisal could kill the deal. Absolutely. Right. And it does happen and we have seen things go back on market. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's strong. Like you said, I mean even the brief story, you right. said there are eight offers on this one house, right? And that's a price range thing. Yeah. You know, there's not that in every price range. That's, you know, the lower price range and I can also tell you that that's part of the reason you don't want to navigate this alone. There's people that think, oh, because it's a seller's market, I don't need an agent to help me. You may not need a, an agent to get sold, yeah. but to sift between multiple offers you do, to navigate that process in between with negotiating repairs and negotiating appraisal and stuff like that, I would hire an agent. I would not do this alone. Well, the other thing that you mentioned is if you're priced too high, then people, um, you know, they're, they'll sniff that out. But however, if you've been in your house for 10 or 15 years, you know the market's up, but you really don't have a great sense for what the value of your house is. So you need to talk to an experienced realtor who can come in and show you comps and say, hey, here's where I think we need to price. That price will likely surprise you. But if you're just going alone, you might way underprice or might way overprice. Talk a little bit about the process of someone who says, yep, now is the time to buy. Diane and the Inspire team, that's who I need to go with. So they, they, they reach out to you. What's the process like from there for a seller? Great question. So when they call us, we're going to set them up with one of the agents on the team that has bandwidth for mm-hmm. a new listing and is maybe a good personality fit for you or an area specialist in that particular price range or area of town, et sure. cetera. And so we'll go out on a listing appointment. We study the comparable sales in that area and bring that data with us. And then we walk them through the entire process. Here's, you know, here's when we should go up. Here's the price at which you should go up. Here's our stager and the things you should do to get the home ready to sell. Here's our photographer. And we walk you through every single step of the way. And I can tell you, I showed a house yesterday that my buyer thought, if this was perfect and pristine like the first house we saw, it was worth the price. But it was tired. Wow. It was a tired house. And buyers want it perfect. They don't want to do anything. Mm-hmm. So Very, very interesting. I'm curious about what role, you know, I'm a geek. You guys all know that. You know, Kevin's, oh, yes. Kevin's the funny one. Josh the smart one. I'm the geek. Laugh a minute. Um, but uh, I'm curious what interest rates, rising interest rates, could do to mortgage price to to mortgage uh, rates 
and mortgage payments and what that could do to the housing market. So I've got that question as well as the big issue with some of the booming construction around town. I'm not sure if you've seen this, but my eyes are wide open. In the last 15 years, it seems like more construction is happening right now in this area than any time in the past 15 years. So that and more coming up here on Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. So what happens if that's 10.05 and you only that's have okay. 30 minutes? Casey is a magician. Oh, and he, like, squonk shit? Yeah. Those <coughs> that happen every once in a while. Like, <laughs> seconds here and there. It's really cool. It's, it's amazing. So he, is that a good word? Squinches it? Yeah, Squinches sure. it. Yeah. Okay, it. Mike. Uh, oh, so I actually just sent you something in Slack, but you don't. Okay. So it, <laughs> the, the article is mortgage rates have been rising at a pace not seen in almost 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you cite that? That's a little bonus content for you on YouTube, but maybe... Let's. So I would say let's keep following the outline. Yes. To yes. I think you should share that on. Hmm? I think you should share that on the video. <laughs> he does. Yeah, we don't cut the, sure, what? the. This is bonus content on YouTube. Actually, the 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 stuff on the breaks is some sometimes the deepest, error funniest stuff, and we just. So let it you roll. keep this. We're still on YouTube. We're, we're still, still on going. YouTube. Hi say, YouTube. Say, YouTube. Say, Why? We're still on. <laughs> I thought yeah. I had a break to drink. No, drink. no, no. You can take a drink. Yeah, but just don't slurp. Um, someone did that during the show, uh, the last ten minutes. Was it me? <laughs> I, that I hope expression. It was. That expression looked like the that. last ten minutes. Oh, just this past. Second? Yes. Oh yeah, still a little hot, man. <laughs> Come on. God gave me these big lips. I have to be careful. We're gonna get you a sippy cup. Okay. So okay, I, let's pick it back up. Yeah, let's. Uh, Oh, okay. Hey. Oh, you have to save the 10 minute segments at a time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Take 10 minutes to save it. Mm. All right, great. All right. Okay. <clears throat> what impact will rising interest rates have on the housing market? I'm curious about that. It impacts mortgage payments, it certainly impacts the economy. I'm assuming you're curious about that too. We've got that and more coming up. This is Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group coming to you from the world headquarters of Corhorn Financial Group. And the KFG Studios. My name's Mike. I've got Kevin Corhorn with me and special guest, Realtor Diane Bennett. Thanks for being with us. Special thanks to the attorneys at Ledoux, Curran, and Keene, as well as First State Bank for making the Wise Money Show possible. Today, we are getting Diane's State of the Housing Market Address. And uh -huh. we are talking about buying, or excuse me, selling. We're going to be talking about buying here in just a minute and have some questions. If you have questions for us, you can reach us a couple different ways. 574-222-2000. You can call or text 574-222-2000, online, wisemoneyradio.com, and YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, at Wise Money Radio. Let's pick it back up with interest rates, Diane. So, Kevin, the, you, you just saw some data on what interest rates Yeah, hot off the presses here. Mortgage rates continued their upward march this week, extending the most prolonged increase in rates in 46 years. That is crazy. So mortgage rates are kind of standing on end. A, a year ago, the 15-year mortgage was at about 3%, and now it's at about 3.8%. Now, it's a national average, so it's going to be different mm -hmm. depending on institutions and whatnot. But if you... It, a good barometer, it's not a perfect barometer, but a, a decent barometer is to kind of keep your eye on the 10-year Treasury note yeah. because whatever the vector of that is, that's likely where mortgage rates are headed. But that's geek speak. So have we seen... The, I'm glad you called that geek speak. It is. Because it have, that, a lot of that's over <laughs> my head. I work with so are buyers and sellers. These rising interest rates, have they impacted <laughs> the housing market yet? And what do we think about it moving forward? So I can't tell you if I think it's all about the interest rates because, you know, they are higher, but they still are ranging down to 4.625 to 5.25 in our immediate area is what my um, yeah. mortgage, my preferred mortgage lender that I call the most just texted me this morning because I wanted the most recent update. Okay, great. And um, and he says that's the seven-year high for our area. So it but that's might still be the, crazy low. That's still it's lower. Crazy low. Lower. My my first house, and I, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, I'm I'm not that old. I, my first house was just under seven percent, and I thought I was getting a good deal. Mm -hmm. I and, remember helping a client get a mortgage for six point two five percent, and telling them you'll likely never, you'll be telling your friends about this because no one will ever see a mortgage rate like this again. 
Yeah. So, right. so so they're still crazy low. Yeah. And it's still a great time to buy. It and, is. And so, but you haven't, I mean, as far as activity, have we seen, do you know, have we seen activity pick up in our area year over year or has it stayed the same? Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. The, it's picked up in our area. Um, th- th- we're also seasonal, though, and I feel like the the buying season in the South Bend, St. Joe County, Elkhart County, Southern Michigan area typically kind of slows by May. So we're oh. kind of past peak Whoa. in general, which is not a big deal. We sell mm-hmm. houses 12 months a year. I sell yeah. houses in November, December, January all the time. No big deal. But it is not the spring selling season. We're not seeing as many showings on brand new listings. We're not seeing as many offers. It's just, that's just what happens typically in May and June. It kind of, you know, people mm-hmm. think May, June is still prime selling season. And we do sell a lot of homes in May and June. I mean, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. We sell a lot of homes in May and June, but it is not as crazy as March and April were. Yeah. It's just not. I, that's my sense as well. Interest rates going up. I I would think that the housing market might slow down a bit, and it's, it really hasn't. Seasonally, it slowed down from a couple of months ago, but it's still activity-wise, it's up. So, okay, so here's the question. And I, I purposely didn't put these two together. So if it's a great time to sell, does that mean it's a terrible time to buy? No, it really doesn't because the low interest rates. You can still get a good deal in a house. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you need to be patient. Um, went on a listing appointment on, I guess it was Saturday, and they are considering selling. And is it the time to buy first? It just depends on your scenario. If you need to sell first before you buy, but you're not sure you can find your buy, yeah. this family needs to look at, is there interim housing they can live in? Or because what they have is a pretty great high demand type of property, could we put theirs up with a contingency of this is only if we can find something? Are you seeing more contingencies right now? Contingencies for buyers are are rare because they can go pick the next buyer. More th- at this time, contingencies for I don't want to sell unless I find. Exactly. And, and, there, and sellers are a little afraid to do that. Well, who's going to want to buy my house if I do that? So sellers are a little bit fearful of doing it. And it's not as easily snapped up mm-hmm. as the one that doesn't put that. So the best scenario is if you know you've got an interim place to go. That's yeah. the best scenario. Or if you're in the luxury position of being able to buy without selling, which I have other clients that can do that. They can go out and find what they want. And they know theirs is going to sell quickly. If, if you're in the financial position that you can do that, great. But don't just assume that your house is one of the ones that's going to go. Mm-hmm. You need to talk to a professional. It's refreshing to hear you say that. So yeah. in a perfect world, you would sell your house, go to closing. It's all done. You know what the proceeds are. You know what you have to work with. And then you would buy the next one. But most people... It doesn't work like that. And so, but if you did the move twice thing, which is expensive. And and that's why most people don't do that because I suggested that a couple of different times. And and each time my wife said, I'm not moving twice. And so I said, well, I guess we're not moving twice, are we? (laughs) So, uh, but so what, what would interim, what's a good example of interim housing or some creative ideas for interim housing? Because Corhorn basement. I do. Yeah. Well, and that's always, (laughs) that is always open. Um, but I, I do wonder if, if someone's out there listening and thinking, well, I would like to have the proceeds of this house. I'm willing to move twice. What am I looking at a, at a 12 month lease at an apartment around town or, or what, what would I, what would I be looking for? The easiest, most ideal is if you have loved ones, friends or family that could put you up and you can put your things into a storage facility. A client that you guys referred to me had mm-hmm. the privilege of living with her daughter and, son-in-law and granddaughter for nearly six months. And and it was really awesome bonding time for grandma and granddaughter. Oh, cool. Really awesome bonding I was going to say, if you want to keep them as loved ones, (laughs) make sure you're very aware of when you're going to move out. And that is fairly well communicated. But but you can maybe ask for a 60 to 90 day closing period instead of the typical 30. Mm. And then maybe you can, you know, stay there. I had a buyer to purchase a home that the seller was building, which I know we want to talk about Mm -hmm. later is building. And so the seller was able to say, we're not moving out until, and my buyer wanted the house and was able to stay where they were and say, great, we'll buy it and we'll give you, you know, all this post-closing possession where they rent back the house. I don't know. Maybe it might just be me, but thinking about all of that and the financial implications and the real life implications just makes me sweat. And I just will tell you, I will encourage you right now, 
make sure you've got a trusted realtor mm -hmm. in your corner to help you with all these big decisions and make sure your certified financial planner is involved in that process as well because there's big financial implications and then there's real life implications and where that messiness of life meets is between a competent realtor, you, and your certified financial planner. Let's talk about the buying process then. So someone's looking at buying. I don't know. Maybe their house is already listed or maybe they need to talk to you about that too. But what's the process like for a buyer when they call Inspired? So again, we're going to hook them up with the agent who seems to fit their personality, the area in town that they're looking, and has bandwidth because you want to make sure that someone can give you the kind of attention that you need. And so we're going to hook them up. We set up a search. Are they looking in both states? Are they looking just in this area? What what exactly are they looking for? The, there are certain things that you can put in, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, acreage, that kind of stuff you can put in. Oh, I want open concept. I want um, to make sure you know, I don't know, that the the kitchen's updated or whatever. You can't really put that into MLS for your search. So mm. those you just kind of have to manually look at and see what it looks like through the pictures, which if you're just looking on Realtor.com, which is my favorite, don't look at anything else but Realtor.com or maybe Remax.com. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the pictures can be deceiving. You can have pictures that look fabulous and the house is a little more tired than it looks. And you can have pictures that aren't that great because maybe the photographer that took those wasn't the the – most skilled photographer and the house is way better than the photos look. So, mm. you know, don't count on everything, but yeah, look and see, is it got the open concept that you want or whatever else? So, you know, another quick, you know, talking about going online, um, because we found our first house online while working with the realtor and we found our second house through Diane. We did not see it online and she found it for us. And right now with how strong the housing market is, those good houses are going before they'll even land on Zillow. Right? Well, and we're sending out postcards to neighborhoods saying, I've so, got a buyer that wants something in your neighborhood. Are you considering selling? And work with a realtor because they'll have the inside scoop before maybe it even hits the Internet. So speaking of all of this, I've mentioned it a couple of times. We need to talk about new construction. We've got that and a couple listener questions about houses coming up here on Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. So... I don't know what I was going to ask you. It was something about that. Where are you seeing that? Because it's... In the reflection right there. Oh, so, got yeah, it. So... I'm like, because you never look that way I and know. you know the time. Here's the thing, Diane. He's a pro. I, I, I'm the only one that needs the clock. <laughs> and we decided to put the clock in the one place that I can't see it. It's very strange. So, But thankfully, after we did that, I could see it in the reflection. So Now Mike knows Thanks how I feel. Sometimes great information, and sometimes it's. Awesome. Well, the other quick bonus content: How are we doing on saving? Very forty-seven. Um, is so you know the the Wise Money Show is not a commercial. It's not a commercial or infomercial for Corhorn Financial Group. It's not a commercial for Diane Bennett. It is you know we're just trying to help, and um, but I would tell you, Casey said, and we might be able to bring this out in the next segment that we're now at a twelve-year high for um, housing prices. Makes sense. That goes back to 06. 06 was the high right before the crash. Um, so the crash, we did a lot of realtors out. They couldn't make it. Well, and now we're back. New, and there's a lot of new ones in. That's my point. Now we're back. The housing market's been great for the past four years. And so you've got a lot of people who say, yeah, sure, I can sell a house. You're going to want someone on your team who's been, who's run the miles and, and has the experience like Diane and her team. So now you need more bandwidth because there's more buyers out there. So I'm not poo-pooing people who are new realtors. Just but make sure if you're working with an, a new agent that they have a, an experienced mentor behind exactly. them. Exactly. That's my you know, point. Yeah. That's, and it, we've got the same thing here at KFG. So mm -hmm. we've got folks that have been through the last two crashes, but we also are creating bandwidth of unbelievable professionals who are still newer and, and have started in the past five years. Yeah. In the spirit of bonus content, that, that we're not the only guys on the radio that say you should work with a realtor. And it is it is tricky because people – selling your house or buying a house, is it's such a simple concept. The execution, as right. soon as you touch the first thing, it it's incredibly complicated. So that's that's where we – Good. Are we good? We're good. We're, we are huge believers in professional advice. Yes. 
And beware of the person that knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing because I've just seen it. And our the best deals that we've gotten on houses are we bought them directly from the person. They weren't using a realtor. And we did on our side to, to do the transaction. I'm and, so glad you did. I, I mean, yeah. when we went through the slump and there were short sales, most of the short sales were people that bought by owner without the help of a realtor. Yeah. yeah. They thought there they were go. getting a deal because they were like, oh, the seller would say that we're saving the commission. Yeah, no, they they <laughs> didn't. Ha- but if you buy for sale by owner with the help of a realtor, for sure. But if you're a seller, I don't think that you're helping yourself to go with that. Why? If your buyer has a realtor and you don't have somebody advising you, how do you know that you're negotiating those? Pa- I mean, I don't care if you sold 10 houses. Yeah. We sold 10 in the last two weeks. Right. You know, yeah. so. That's yep. the experience. Um, okay, so 10 minutes for this third segment. That'll get you out of here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we'll pick it up with new construction, mm-hmm. and then we'll go into Chuck's question and maybe get Sally's into this third segment as well, although uh, I'm assuming we might just get Chuck's because we'll talk a lot, which is good. We'll <laughs> so. try to get to Sally because i got answers for Sally. All right, well, we'll, we'll try. You want to start with Sally? No. Okay. No, he wants Chuck. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. My name's Mike here with Kevin Corhorn and special guest realtor with REMAX 100, Diane Bennett. Thank you to Bethel College Adult and Graduate Studies, as well as thank you, Diane Bennett, for making the Wise Money Show possible. Uh, We've been talking about Diane's state of the housing market address, what's going on if you're selling, what's going on if you're buying, and what should you be doing if you're thinking about building? That's coming up in just a second. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us a few different ways. Let me just remind you, wisemoneyradio.com, 574-222-2000. You can call or text, 574-222-2000. Every episode's on YouTube. Check it out. Subscribe. Hit that little like button if you like the content. And Facebook and Twitter as well. Just search Wise Money Radio. Oh, podcast as well. you got to type the whole thing in, uh, Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group, iTunes, Google Play. All right, Diane, I, so I've lived here. God brought me down here from, or actually right out of East Lansing, Michigan, graduated from Michigan State. Before that, I grew up, born and raised in Grand Rapids. And I've been here since 03, and I've never seen as much construction in this area as right now. Oddly enough, right after going through this period where everyone said, well, you can't build anymore in St. Joe County. I mean, pretty much all of the spots to build are gone. No. Legacy's got their big development that they're doing. Klein has two developments, I think. I mean, so how, you know, you're a realtor, so you're not necessarily involved a lot in the building, although I'm assuming oh, no. you... we have buyers that want to build, for Okay, sure. so, so, so break down all the new construction, how that impacts the housing market, kind of what your take is on all of that. So the first thing I would tell you is you've got to look at price point because... You really can't build new for less than high twos at at the most, yeah. at the least. And and they're, most of them are the much more expensive homes than that. Right. So that's the biggest thing. It's just not cost effective for a builder. They can't build a home that, that inexpensively. So you've got to look at existing if you're in those lower price points. Um, the second thing would be when you're considering a builder, I would hire a realtor for that. Because, really? Yeah, I would. Because you want somebody that's in your corner helping make sure, you know, the builder wants to take great care of you because he wants to have a great reputation. He wants you to sing his praises when he when you're done yeah. so that he can keep building in the area. But even though he does, he's still trying to be careful with his own bottom line. He's got, you know, employee issues. He's got to make sure he's got enough staff to do the different things. And what about supplies? You know, can he get the wood and the flooring and the whatever else he needs to build your home? You know, he's got to work on all that stuff. So he can't always be thinking about your best interest. So if you hire a realtor to walk you through the process, I highly recommend it. It's going to help you make, you know, decisions. Oh, hey, Miss Realtor that's working for me or sir, um, what, you know, what's going to sell better when I sell this? If I'm going to live in it for 10 years or 20 years, you know, I still am likely to sell it again. So let me make wise decisions. It's not just for what I want, but also to think about resale when you're building. So there's that. Those, well, you, are, those are things to ask. You've got to be thinking about resale when you're buying or building. And, and, Absolutely. And, but especially in the building, you know, you might say, I love these light blue floors and, you know, these bright purple counters. That's perfect for my taste. Well, maybe, but you also need to think about when you sell the place. Let me, let me ask you this. Sellers right now who are looking to build, 
how do you coach them through that process? Because the build, they've, you know, could take what, nine months, maybe, and they, they're all the builders are busy. So could take a while. But a seller probably wants to capitalize on the housing market right now before interest rates continue to rise and so on. How do you coach them through? Is that back to the Hopefully you've got family in the area or. And it's back to the have you spoken to your financial planner because your financial planner can tell you what kind of situation you have. So, you know, if you're if you're in a good, stable financial situation, I think you're fine to stay in your house and try and sell it next year. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what next spring is going to look like or whatever, but it's probably the most cost effective to stay right where you are and Mm. sell later. That's probably the most cost effective and least headache. It's almost like I planned it, but that's a great segue into <laughs> into a question from fan of the show, Chuck. Chuck is from Osceola. Here's what he said. About a month ago, my neighbor put his house on the market, and it sold for the full amount within a week. With prices that high, I just decided to test it. I've heard this from other people. Just, oh, I don't really need to sell. I'm just going to see. And we ended up selling our house for about 25000 more than what I expected. We didn't have a plan. On what to buy next. So we're thinking about building. What steps do we need to be aware of financially to go through this? Diane or Kevin, who who wants to start with uh, with helping helping Chuck here? Because my answer would be start with your financial planner. Let's go with Kevin. What would you tell him first? This is what I would tell him. I would say, Chuck, if if the if your team will allow it, I would rent a place. I'd sign a twelve to eighteen month lease. And I would get settled. I'd get a bunch of stuff in storage, and I'd really simplify. And then I would, that takes all the pressure off. Because when you don't have walkaway power, when you've got fine, some sort of pressure on you to make a decision, and that decision is, is going to be one of the bigger financial decisions you're going to make in your life, you are in a bad spot. So if you want to have, uh, Chuck, you want to have that kind of self-awareness to recognize where you are. Yeah. And so I love the idea of finding a place that you can just be stationary for 12 to 18 months. And you say, well, what if we get the house built in nine months and we have three months left on the lease? If you look at the finances, you've sold your house at, at a, a, a 12-year high. It's in there. It's in there. You can walk away and pay an extra three months of rent, yeah. and you'll be you'll be just fine. You'll be much better off than if you if you had made a bad decision in the interim. I, I cannot agree more. I'm telling you, in in nearly 12 years of selling real estate, the ones that had deadlines that had to be in by struggled in their negotiating power all day long. Really? And I also recommend don't close until everything is done that you want, which you can't do if you have to be in the house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if oh, you, I didn't think about if that. the timing is requiring that you must be in by, you lose negotiating power. Sometimes you'll close earlier than everything's done, and then you're trying to do things after the fact when they're already closed and they already have their money. And not that they don't want to take care of you, because again, they want to worry about their reputation. But you're just so much better off if you can wait and have everything done before you close, and yeah. then it's smooth. So when you're well, when you have this pocket of time, in this case, Chuck, I would also recommend you're going to do at least two budgets as well. And I know that's kind of nasty, but in this interim time, your your expenses, your cash flow is going to look very different. But also, when you get into the new house, guess what? The old furniture is not going to look as nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's going to be things that you're going to want to buy as well. So you've got to build a budget and set some goals for that interim. Okay, here's what the new cash flow situation looks like. And hopefully, here's how much I can start saving because I'm out of the old house and I'm just renting or whatever. But then you also need to be aware of what the new budget is with the new mortgage, with the new house. And so you'll want to build both of those, work with your certified financial planner on that. Let's uh, let's sneak this next question in. It's a great one from Sally. It's a tough situation, though. Um, Sally's from Osceola as well and says, I am recently divorced. I'm looking to buy a home, but I'm really struggling to know how much I can afford. My fan- my finances aren't that great, but I have about $30,000 from the settlement from the divorce that I assumed would go towards a down payment. Here again, this just illustrates how you need a great realtor on your team, but you also need a certified financial planner. I don't know how you make this decision without both of those very competent professionals in your life. So, again, I would open it up to the two of you. How, how would you start helping Sally here? 
So again, I would I would also recommend that she talk to her certified financial planner because I don't know what her finances look like. Sometimes people are concerned about working with me because, you know, I don't know you and I don't know if I, if I want to tell you all my finan- finances. You know what? I'm not asking financial questions. The lender that you work with, and I have a list of lenders I recommend, they're going to tell you that. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the first steps when they come as a buyer. I'm going to send them to a, a, a reputable lender who's got experience and gets the deals closed and knows how they're advising and has high integrity. And then I'm going to have them talk to their certified financial planner about – you know, what can they afford? Can they do a 3.5% down loan and keep some of that money for, you know, anything else that they need if they need to buy furniture afterwards or whatever? Can yeah. can they – or is the PMI that they pay when they have less than 20% down going to be too high for them? And those are questions that they need to talk to their, their financial planner and their lender. Yeah, and I would say, Sally, talk to your financial planner because when you've gone through a traumatic event like this – it it's going to feel bad, especially if you feel like you're taking a step back. And so this is where you really want to deal with the internal finance side of this. And um, so, Mike, take it away. <laughs> Diane's got to run. Thanks for being with us today, Diane. How do people find you online? A team at inspiredhomes.com is our email address. Website is inspiredhomes.com. Awesome. Thanks for being on. We look forward already to having you back next time. Thanks so much. More listener questions coming up here on Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. Great job. Ugh. Am I squished? No, oh, here looks perfect. <laughs> oh, here looks perfect. Oh, we're still recording, aren't when we? When you go yeah, on no, Facebook Live, people are going to say, that gal must have been in the studio so, this morning. Diane, <laughs> actually, so <laughs> bonus content it. for YouTube. I know you have to run, but you want to tell them what you do with your um, your videos every Friday? Oh, Just, thanks. So I appreciate go ahead, you. Go ahead and share that. Let me say that. So, um, oh, I guess I need to still be on here, and I'm yeah, not hearing okay. myself because I took my headphones off. But, yes, so every single Friday morning on Facebook Live, you can go to um, the Facebook page for Inspired Homes. We interview people who have had some kind of moment in their life that kind of pointed them back towards God, whatever it was. So we ask them three questions. It's called Life Inspired, and it has our three dots from our logo, life dot, 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 inspired. And so life was going along. What did that look like for you? The dot, dot, dots are like, and then God or Seinfeld's yada, 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 or something like that. Something happened in your life that turned your direction. What was that turning point in your life? And then now you're walking an inspired life. You're inspired by God to do different things. And we've had amazing, inspiring stories like um, you shared about the one, the girl uh, went to school for sign language. Um, This is Emily on our team. And she, after two years working as a sign language interpreter, found that her body is um, not able to do that full time. It Mm. just was too much for her. We've had cancer survivors. We've had divorce survivors. I had um, a gentleman whose um, third son was diagnosed to be Down syndrome in the womb, and they were trying to encourage him to have an abortion, and they just prayed and prayed and prayed. God, we don't think that's what we're supposed to do. If you you want us to carry this child to term and whatever, that's great, whatever. Yeah, he was born totally fine, no Down syndrome or anything. And people wanted him to abort, wanted his wife to abort. And, um, you know, just crazy, crazy stories, job loss, loss of a child, crazy stories that really encourage other people. So, yeah, we'd love for you to watch anytime. Thanks Thanks for doing that, because, you know, the Wise Money Show is about trying to enrich the community. Right. And get a conversation started. And I appreciate that's exactly what you're doing, trying to enrich our community. It's online. So the online community, which I guess is worldwide. Right. But uh, but thank you. For that. Absolutely. So. Thanks for letting me share. I'm going to run. Bye, All Facebook. Right. Bye, <laughs> YouTube, whatever. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. And That's I'm great. like ripping up your wall. That's all right. Daniel's got it. So, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks. Good job. Good to see you again. Yeah. All right. So, Negotiations 101, May 2nd, 2014. You see this? The best deals you can make are the ones you can walk away from and then get them with better terms, Donald Trump. Hey, wow. It's uh, North Korea. Ah, that's Within right. hours of him canceling, he came back to the table and said, no, 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 we still want to talk. Right. They I did? Saw, I saw that, yeah, I saw that headline. Oh, okay. oh, 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 so I shouldn't look at, at um, Yahoo News and, yeah. and read the lessons that Donald Trump has learned about negotiation? I had to take a professor at the War College to cast on Twitter yesterday because he said North Korea. Oh my goodness. Uh, hey, I just, I am getting tired of winning. He told us we were going to get tired of winning. 
I'm just, I'm a little worn out from all the winning. But see, we win twice every time he does something. Because we win as a country, and then when they all get butthurt about it, <laughs> and then we prove them wrong, we win again. <laughs> yeah, some guy, there was a professor at the War College that North Korea won this. I was like, nobody's opinion of North Korea has changed. Right. He hostages right. back, and he blew up a nuclear site, which may or may not have been functional anyway. Right. Clearly, we have a couple of notches in the wind column, and they haven't accomplished anything. All right, yeah. Oh, they're legitimate. There's no legitimacy. <laughs> Nobody's opinion of it has changed. None. I love it. All right. So, All right. one more segment. So, yeah. we're jumping into more questions. Yeah. Is there anything left on the bone that you want to... Dude, I, I think... I think. I mean, there's more we the, could talk about the, with Sally. For okay. sure, with Sally, the okay. the. Uh, I'll pick it back up. Well, we there, Be, because of the. Um, yeah, it because it's confusing when you have a settlement and you think that money. I mean, you kind of spend that money four times over, and and you don't always realize. Yeah, but I was actually supposed to be allocating some here, or here. So yeah, we'll we'll let's pick that one back up. <clears throat> yep. Okay. <clears throat> the, the one that got me would be was the folks that put the house up and didn't have a plan. Yeah, that line just jumped at me. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> that's, that's big, real. It's a big movement to not have a plan. All right. If you plan on helping grandkids with college and want to open up a five twenty nine, do you need to open up a five twenty nine plan for every single grandchild? That's a great question coming up here from Tom. That and more. This is Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group coming to you from the KFG studios. My name is Mike. Across from me, Kevin Corhorn. Diane Bennett with Remax 100 was our special guest on the program today. She had to run. She had actually another video interview and uh, engagement. So we appreciate her being on the program. If you missed anything, I would encourage you to catch up on this episode and others. You can do so. My favorite way is on YouTube. You can find us find the YouTube channel at Wise Money Radio there. You can also find it on podcast. Subscribe to that also. iTunes, Google Play. you got to search Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. That's K-O-R-H-O-R-N. Online, wisemoneyradio.com. And lastly, if you have questions, if you have issues, if you need anything, whatever, you can call us or text us, 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. We are into listener questions from fans of the show, and we left off with Sally's question, and, and I'm going to read it again just because there's a little bit more that we need to touch on here. We got Diane's input, but there's a, a touch more. Sally's from Osceola. Here's what she asked. I'm recently divorced. I'm looking to buy a home, but I'm really struggling to know how much I can afford. My finances aren't that great, but I have about $30,000 from the settlement that I'm assuming would go towards the down payment. So, Kevin, what else stands out to you? Well, Sally, about that. Well, first of all, Sally, thanks for the question. And what stands out to me about this is that when people go through a traumatic event, there's often a, a season where they're in some sort of a fog or haze and they're not able to make great decisions. And then you say, well, what kind of decisions do I need to make? Well, if you need to make a housing decision, that's a pretty big and a pretty permanent decision and the stakes are fairly high with that one. And it can be somewhat confusing because, Sally, you, if you said your finances aren't great, that's fine. That's not a problem. It would be a problem to stay in that state. Yes. Or, yes. or to buy a house that ensured that you would be saying my finances aren't great for the next 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I would really, really, really encourage you to find a financial planner. And again, this is one that's certified. And it's confusing because when, when you look at financial planners, um, you, you might see, oh, well, this is a name that I've heard of, so I'm going to go uh, talk to them. And maybe they only sell investments. Yeah. So it's, it is confusing. So look for a certified financial planner that does financial planning because Mike earlier in the show had referred – to the idea of doing two budgets. And Most I, people don't want to do one. <laughs> and I went <Right>. out there. <laughs> and that's fine. Work with a certified financial planner because it, then that person can help you with both of them. Yeah. And the second one, once the first one is done, the second one's fairly easy. And look at it. And, and Sally, maybe you're looking at two different versions of your life. One version of my life is 
I'm all house all the time. All my money goes into a house, and I want a certain kind of house because that's what I was used to living in. Or you say, no, I'm willing to kind of um, skinny down on my house, my housing expectations. I might not need as much as I had before. And it's confusing because you say, no, you know, we have four children, and I want to be able to have a place where these four children can come to. And I have done the math with folks and said, hey, look, you, you, if you bought this smaller house, you'd save enough money to have all four kids and their families at a hotel for a weekend once a month if you wanted to. Right. And you, they don't want to. It's just, it's, you know, three or four times a year. So I say, okay, well, look, you can easily host them in a hotel, in a bed and breakfast, in an Airbnb around town and, and get them together. And granted, it won't be at your house. But if you have this bigger house and this bigger payment and these higher taxes and higher utilities and higher maintenance, all this stuff. So it's, it's really, it's really important Sally, to get in touch with what's really important to you. We we try to uncover your core values and then find a way to attach your core values to what you're trying to achieve financially. It's not easily done, but if you're willing to do the work, the rewards are so great. What I would underscore is, is um, that you mentioned your finances aren't great, and I would just tell you um, that's – that may have been the case before divorce. D- divorce really upends your finances. And so this is a very critical point for you to make some great financial decisions mm-hmm. so that you can get on a better path. But I would also underscore the emotions at work here. You are grieving. You're, gr- you're grieving. And, and it's just hard to make really clear, great financial decisions in wherever you are in the stages of grief. Um, I had a, a client about 10 years ago who reached out to me um, a week after her husband tragically died. And sure enough, she was very quick to say, so I got to sell the house and I got to do these sorts of things. And I said, listen, we're just going to wait for 12 months. We're going to wait 12 months before we make a big financial decision like that. She's still in the same house. 10 years later, she's come to me at least twice a year with a housing decision that's different every time. But we have saved thousands of dollars by just being patient. Now, don't let your imagination fool you. I, I'm not telling her no, and so she just keeps trying to get out of it. No, she's just trying to figure out what she wants, what her new life needs to look like as a widow. And so, anyway, um, let's jump to Tom's question next. Tom is from South Bend. He says, I'm thinking about starting a 529 plan for my first grandchild. The problem comes in is that I hope to have more grandkids in the future. Yeah, you don't have full control over that, do you? Do I set up one for each of them? That's a great question, Tom. We get this all the time. I'd first applaud your desire to help out with college. Number one, it should help you on your taxes, right? If you're doing it the right way, working with a certified financial planner, depending on your situation, said you live in South Bend, if you're paying Indiana state tax, use the right 529 plan and you should be able to get some benefits there. But then second, I love the idea of you um, leaving a legacy, if you will, passing on an, a, a, a challenge and an opportunity to grandkids. So what do you do when you have no idea? When you've got the first one, but maybe that's the only one, or maybe there'll be seven. What do you do? Yeah, well, Tom, I would, my personal preference is to start with one, and you can annually put up to, let's say, $250,000 into that. I, you're, we're likely not talking about that. So let's talk. Most folks are looking at putting, you can put, you can get a 20% credit on up to $5,000 contributed. So most people think, well, you know, my limit is $5,000. It isn't. It's nope. way bigger than that. But for for most people, they say, hey, I'm going to put the 5000 in. That'll get me $1,000 back on my Indiana taxes. So that's a good place to start. And if you And then you say, well, then where do we go beyond that? Then what I would encourage you to do is for the parents, encourage the parents to set up a 529, if the parents live in Indiana especially, encourage them to set up a 529 plan for that grandchild as well. And then as birthday money comes in or Christmas money, things like that, they can be funding that because the, because Tom, you put your 5,000 in, you get your thousand bucks, the, your children 
uh, parents of the grandchild can do the same thing. They can get a thousand dollar credit. And when mm-hmm. when you think about that, think you you get one per household, so you get one thousand dollar credit per household. Yep. Yep. I like the idea of starting with one as well. Even if you end up having eight grandkids, you you can slice that thing up out there in the future. You can open up a second 529 plan at some time out in the future. And if so, if you end up just having two grandkids, OK, you wait until the first one gets uh, maybe junior year of high school. You dump in all the money each year into this one account. You get you wait till that one's maybe the oldest is a junior in high school. And then you just open up a second account, cut the account in half and split it that way or divvy, divvy it up into threes or fours or five. But I, you know, I'm still fairly squeaky. And so I'd leave it in one account and the, the accounts cost 10 bucks a year. So, yeah, just just leave it in one. Before that, though, Tom, I would encourage you to have a discussion with your spouse if you're married about what the plan is, and you might even want to have a discussion with your kids to, to, so that there isn't any confusion, role confusion, and then set up a goal. I love the goal of we're going to help with just books, okay, or we're going to help with the last year of school or something like that, but make sure there aren't any conf- assumptions out there that could cloud up. Um, what the real intention here is. So thanks for the question. Great question. I want to also thank Diane Bennett for being on the program with us. Again, if you missed anything, you can find it on the YouTube channel or or online. That is all the time we have for today, folks. On behalf of Kevin Corhorn, myself, and all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.